I'm, I'm standing up here with a Roman collar and an MIT ring. This is an MIT ring, it's not a bishop's ring, don't kiss it. <laughs> and the fact that I'm wearing both of them is sort of living proof that you can be at the same time both a fanatic and a nerd. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm a fanatic about my science, actually, and, and a bit of a nerd about my church. This is going to be a science and religion talk. Now, since it's being sponsored here at the Vatican, I assume many of you are probably familiar with religion, for better or worse. You have an idea what religion is. But I suspect fewer of you are actually practicing scientists. Do I have a show of hands? How many of you are scientists? Kind of what I thought. So, I figure anybody who invites an astronomer should at least expect some pretty pictures, so I've brought a few pretty pictures here. And I want to start out by doing a little bit of science so you have an idea of what science is all about. I start with this picture because it's a beautiful one, one that a lot of you have seen before. It was a favorite of my students back 30 years ago when I was in the US Peace Corps in Kenya. And you can tell Kenya is right in the center of Africa there, so it's right in the center of the picture. They could see themselves. And they're, they're thrilled about this. And then I'd say, okay, when was this picture taken? And they'd look and they'd go, well, what do you mean? When would... Well, in Kenya, right there in the center of the picture, right on the, the, uh, the east coast of Africa there. What time of day is it? Is it day or night? Well, the, the, the sun's shining on it. I guess it must be daytime. Good. Is it morning or is it afternoon? You know, is the earth about to turn to move Kenya into the dark? Or has the earth turned to move Kenya out of the dark? And this is a little bit trickier. Now, which way is the earth turning? And give you a hint. Where is the sun? Oh, it's, it's off that way. So if you're standing in Kenya, which direction do you look to see the sun? Oh, you're looking to the west. It must be afternoon. Okay, okay, can do that. What season is it? It's a trick question. Kenya's on the equator. It doesn't have seasons. <laughs> well, actually, my students looked at it, saw the clouds over Kenya, and says, it's the rainy season, which was exactly true. In the northern hemisphere, can you tell what season it is? Well, the Earth seems to be tilted, and the northern part of the Earth is tilted towards the sun, so that you can see that that might be more in light and more time. You can see the way that the equator is kind of slanted that way. You can see how, how the deserts have no clouds over them, so that the Sahara is beautifully dry, and Arabia is beautifully dry. You can see Italy, not a cloud in the sky. You can see Great Britain, which is outlined in cloud, Definitely it's summertime. <laughs> Fine. What year was this picture taken? You go, well, what do you mean? What week was this picture taken? How am I going to figure that from this? Wait a minute. I told you I showed this to my students 30 years ago, 1983. In 1983, we didn't have really good television cameras on satellites that far away from the Earth. This was taken with a Hasselblad with real chemical film. The only people who were able to do that were the astronauts, and this must have been taken during one of the Apollo missions. The only astronauts who were that far away from the Earth. What Apollo mission took place in the summertime? Actually, there were two of them. It was Apollo 11 and Apollo 15. I happen to know that Apollo 15 was in a really southern kind of orbit. This had to be Apollo 11, so it had to be the week of July 16th, 1969. Now you're going to say, wait a minute, that, that, that's a cheat. That isn't in the picture. Science doesn't care where you get the information from. There's no such thing as cheating. <laughs> but you notice also what we've done here. We've taken a picture that you've seen a million times, and we've woven a story about it. We've asked the right questions, and we've pulled the information out of it. Let's do it again. Here's another planet, planet Mars, the way it would look in a small telescope. Percival Lowell would have seen planet Mars in his telescope like this, except, of course, it was freezing cold outside in 1895 when he was looking through the telescope. And you can see, well, there's not as many clouds. There's bright areas and dark areas, and the bright areas are a kind of a bright orangish red. And you can see some red in the dark areas, but you can also see some really dark, dark areas that 
almost look an olive green. And you notice that there are pole caps, so there must be ice, so you assume there's water. And you can see the pole caps growing and shrinking because Mars has seasons just like the Earth. Now, every time you look at Mars and you see the pole cap shrinking in a particular hemisphere, the areas that are covered in the dark area, the olive green area, seem to grow. What's more logical than to say that water from the caps is melting, flooding the plains, not only that, you see areas that appear to be connected together, they almost look like canals. Maybe there are actually intelligent peoples, or at least, you know, rivers, carrying this water, flooding the area, causing it to flourish. It's all perfectly logical, and it's all perfectly wrong. We now know, thanks to the Hubble Space Telescope, thanks to landers on the moon, that in fact, the pole caps are not made out of water. They're made out of carbon dioxide on top of the water. The canals are all optical illusions. The rocks really are gray, not green. And when the pole caps evaporate, it stirs up winds, it blows up the dust. The dust blows off the dark areas, and that's why it appears to be dark. That is also science. Science doesn't stop when it comes up with a nice answer. It looks for more data, it comes up with new ideas, it's willing to admit that it might be wrong. The astronomy that I learned as a student about Mars isn't really valid anymore. You can't learn astronomy from a book that's 50 years old or 500 years old or even five years old. Astronomy books go out of date. You gotta throw them away. It's not true of all old books. You know, if you're reading Dante, it's been around for 700 years, but you still read Dante. Plato, Plato's been around more than 2,000 years. You still read Plato. I wonder what kind of book the Bible is. It can't be a science book because, number one, I don't throw it away, and number two, science books hadn't been invented back when the Bible was written. There is another difference, though, between books of science and books of, say, theology. I mean, theology is a science after all. Theology is the study using reason and logic to try to understand God the way that biology is the study of using reason and logic to try to understand life. And yet, <clears throat> even today, if you're studying theology, and you're reading the most up-to-date theology, you also still want to have Thomas Aquinas on your Kindle. If you're a theologian and had never read the Summa, you'd be a poor theologian. On the other hand, I know a lot of people who do Newtonian physics who have never read Newton. You can learn relativity and never read Einstein's original papers. Because you don't need to. Because, in fact, they're not relevant to the topic anymore. So there is some interesting difference here. I'm going to explore that a little bit further. Now, there's an easy way to describe this difference. It's an easy trap to fall into. It's such a trap that the earlier version of this talk, I fell into it myself. And the trap is to say, ah, there are two kinds of questions. There's the question, do I have enough money in my pocket to buy a candy bar? Once you know the answer to that question, it's not an interesting question anymore. And there's the other question, which is, what is it about chocolate that's so attractive to me? And even after you've got an answer to that question today, that question still remains an interesting question as you change, as your tastes change, as your understanding changes. Okay, well and good, two different types of questions. The trap is to say, ah, the one kind is science and the other kind is religion, as if somehow we're broken into this you know, purely rational or purely emotional kind of world. But remember, that's not how science works. Remember those canals on Mars. Science was both the observation of Mars and the interpretation we added to it. So it was the data. Once we have the data, we don't have to add any more data or we don't have to change that data. But there's also the understanding, which in later times we may want to go back and revisit. You can't divide the world into Kirk and Spock. You can't divide the world into the purely rational, and that's science, or the purely emotional, and that's, you know, religion, because science 
starts with the facts and then builds a story around them. Religion also starts with observations. We've heard the phrase blind faith. I, I, I mentioned to, to uh, Mr. Spock here, Mr. Kirk here, uh, some of the starship commander. I said, you know, the opposite of faith is not doubt. The opposite of faith is certainty. Anne Lamott said this. And he goes, what, what, what do you mean? Wait a minute, wait a minute, what's that about? Well, isn't blind faith where you sort of accept things? Don't science and religion have conflicting ways of accepting facts? And I go, no, science is not a big book of facts. Science is the interpretation, the conversation we have about the facts. And blind faith is not closing my eyes to the truth. What does Moses say? When he comes down with the tablets, he tells his people, remember what you have seen with your eyes and pass that on to your children and your children's children. It's not close your eyes to everything and believe me, it's remember what you have seen and report that. Religion likewise starts with observation. But both science and religion then have to proceed with blind faith, not blind because we're closing our eyes, but blind because we don't have enough information. All of life is filled with making decisions based on inadequate data. And especially made, making decisions based on inadequate data about what school you're going to go to, about what major you're going to make, about what job you're going to take, about who you're going to marry. These are all decisions made without information by stupid teenagers who are stubborn and... and that's me without the beard. Would I trust anything that that kid said? I've trusted my life to what that kid said. How was I able to do it? That's why you look to a community. That's why you have the conversation. That's why you ask your friends, your neighbors, your family. If nothing else, people who can give you worked out examples. If I make this choice, this is what's likely to come up. Yeah, you can try to do it on your own. This is a famous mathematician, Zdenrasa Ramanujan. Single-handedly, without an education, he invented calculus all by himself. It can be done, but it doesn't happen very often. You know, most of us would rather have a teacher and a book. It saves time, if nothing else. But more than that, we need the advice and the community to pass on those books to us and to allow us to pass those books on to the next generation. I work for a big organization all my life as a planetary scientist working at the Vatican. I've been working for a big organization that is a bureaucracy. We hate bureaucracy. Everybody hates bureaucracies. But try living without one. You know, bureaucracies give you at least a minimal amount of functionality, so it doesn't matter who's in charge. It doesn't matter who calls in sick things get done. I've worked for this big bureaucracy that people always complain is out of touch, it's overblown, it's overbloated, it wastes money, the people running it are a bunch of idiots. All of that might be true, but nonetheless, NASA is the only group that was able to get us to the moon. <laughs> the other thing, though, that this, this picture of being on the edge reminds me. G.K. Chesterton has a wonderful story about a hill and children playing on a hill. If there's a wall, they can play within the wall and not worry. If there's no wall, they're afraid of falling off the edge. A scientist is the one who works out where to build the wall because the scientist has already fallen off the edge. The scientist is willing to make the mistakes. The scientist is willing to go out and say that maybe Mars is covered with canals because this inspires new approaches, this inspires new observations. A scientist is not afraid to be wrong. But how do you tell the difference from when you're wrong or when you've really made a breakthrough? It, it, it's, we rely on the community, as, as the, the cartoon here describes. We de rely on referees and editors to tell us that we've made a mistake and we have to have faith also in those referees, knowing that they're not much brighter than we are. That is the, why we have the conversation. That is why we speak one to the other. Are there lessons for religion that can come out of this? 
There are parallels, but there are differences. I mean, science is a, co a collection of human-made theories, a human understanding that is approaching truth without ever completely grasping it. Religion starts with divine truths, which are true, but poorly understood, because while the truth may be divine, we're not. They're both on the same road, but going in different directions. There's not an exact parallel, but there is a sense where I think we can draw some lessons, and I'll give you three. The first is don't be afraid to make mistakes. Don't be afraid to look like a clown, because it's only in making mistakes that you explore new territory. It's only in being willing to admit that I was wrong, which is the other part of making mistakes, that you can then say, I've learned something. You learn from your mistakes. If you've never made a mistake, you've never learned anything. You've never contributed to human knowledge. The second thing, though, to remember is to learn to accept correction from other people, to listen to them, to accept them even if you think they're wrong, because it's in the places where you disagree that both of you have the chance to learn something. And the final thing to remember is to keep the dialogue going. Religion is a conversation among people. It's not a spiritual person by himself. Science is a conversation about the data. It's not one person herself holding on to the data. If you didn't publish it, it didn't happen. Because really, at the end of the day, why are we doing this? What are we in this all for? Why are we scientists? Why are we believers? It's not for money. There's no money in this business, trust me. It's not for power. It's not to get girls, at least it didn't work for me. <laughs> Why do we do this? At the end of the day, we only do science or we only have a religion as an act of worship because both science and religion worship the same God who is the God of truth. Thank you very much.